Hello, it's Jack Tutor here of Attention Magazine. Welcome to Crucial Listening, the podcast where I speak with musicians and sound artists about three albums that are important to them. My guest this time is Rosa Anschutz, who is a singer-songwriter and artist based in Berlin. Rosa has a new album out on Klangbad later this month, February, called Interior, which I've been having a great time with. It's a very spacious record compared to some of Rosa's previous output. Almost feels like it's breathing. There's this sense of textures collating, expressing, and then withdrawing again. Rosa's voice often occupying those spaces once the instruments have retracted, including flutes and organs, slow metronomic pulses. It's a very intense album and definitely has a sense, maybe the titles give me this, but of being someone speaking to themselves and with the vocal harmonies that Rosa does so beautifully, almost acting like divergent strains of thought all flickering in different directions yeah I've been having a great time with it and Rosa was really fun to speak to this conversation goes everywhere I love these editions of the podcast where we end up taking tangents way off in a different direction and then somehow circle back to the records again too so if you're enjoying the podcast you can support it over at coffee, ko-fi.com forward slash crucial listening. You can donate monthly or one off, any amount at all. Nothing too big or too small. And that helps keep the show running. So thank you very much. Okay. Without any further delay, this is Rosa Anschutz on Crucial Listening. Hello, Rosa. Welcome to Hi. Crucial Listening. Hello. Hello, Jack. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. So you're here to talk about your three important albums. Before we get to those, I want to talk about your new album, Interior, uh, on Klangbad. So one thing that struck me about when I've seen you talk about this record is that you mentioned that you wanted to provide the voice with the biggest space it's ever had. Mm. Um why did you want to do that? Mm, because um, before in the records that I recorded, um, we always had a kind of limit until um, a song would be too full in some way because I love adding uh, new vocals and because I do a lot of like this looping um, looping vocals or also mm. instruments. So I'm always adding and adding and adding if you let me. But um, in other um themes of songs or the songs I produced before um there wasn't really space so I decided to make this like the initial album's name it was an EP and it was called the choir EP I mean it's a very basic name but it's uh, it's the purpose of um it's the purpose of this record to mm. um just add and add I think there's like on each track there's about 30 30 different uh vocals um some of them more in the backgrounds some of them more in the front and yeah that was great experience <laughs> i wanted to ask specifically about those harmonies as well because the headphone listen of this record and the experience of those harmonies is so interesting uh y you seem to have a very curious approach to harmonization where they almost have yeah. the sense of being like flocks of birds they're you know not following the main line some of them are kind of peeling away and become momentarily like visible behind it um did you approach 
her doing harmonization you know to say differently or you know was there ways in which you kind of yeah approach that with a that was specific to this record mm, i mean it just um i guess there's also a sense of um an almost if you repeat things again and again and the same phrases um there's almost like a spiritual element to it i think <laughs> mm. in a way that it relaxes um you i mean the sensation um was something i also wanted to bring into the record because the themes around the um lyrics and um also like musically like the organ um my small harmonium and uh, trumpet and traverse flute they're all kind of linked to to the kind of like a sacred um connotation also yeah so with uh this repetition i just wanted to enhance uh the experience also for someone listening to the music so that you can hear these, like all these fragments of um, voices on the record. I also saw a, a remark as well that you have this wish to multiply yourself, um, mm. which I think is a really interesting phrase. I guess there's so many different ways you could understand it as well, but um, uh, literally, I guess, in terms of the vocal harmonies, but I presume as well there are other kind of connotations you're pulling in there. So, yeah, could yeah. you tell me a bit about that? I mean, it's coming from uh, how I initially started with the whole looping thing was because I was coming from, I mean, I always uh, wrote my own songs, but I was also playing in bands, but there was always like like teenage bands, like some rock bands. We were very heavily into um, Black Red, uh, Black, uh, not Black Rebel Motorcycle Club, <laughs> damn it, but um <laughs> or Adam Green so um but uh -huh. the problem with the like being the singer in the band was always that you had some some musicians in the band that always tried to be in the forefront of the band so I very quickly um got myself um independent by looping myself with the guitar and the vocals and I think like multiplying yourself is also a way of um yeah of some free space for yourself so you you don't rely on anybody else than yourself also the multiplication of the self yeah i guess like in this transcendental sense also like uh if there's no um i mean you could do loops uh until the infinity there's <laughs> and nobody stops you just yourself like you're the one who presses the button and stops the um machine at one point so i think that's a very um and it's actually also on the record um but not the it's not a vocal loop but there's um or maybe I shouldn't say that because that takes the <laughs> the um <laughs> the preciousness of having the record actually. But um there's a there's infinity on the B side. Which huh. I really appreciate. Yeah. yeah, I mean one other thing that it really got me thinking about, and I wonder if this had any any resonance was you know, obviously the record is called Interior and it has the sense of being this um at least from my perspective listening, this internal space. Um, mm -hmm. and the idea of multiplying yourself um, reminded me of this sense of having multiple manifestations within you mm. and you know externally often there's a pressure to like only present one of those mm. manifestations whereas internally you can exist in that state of like numerous possibilities uh, so I wondered if there was any of that going yeah. on as well about your you know contemplation of interiors yeah, it's a nice view because actually, um, like the term interior came from um, having read um, a lot from Teresa von Avia. She was a a nun in the very early ages, and she always described the ways of um, of herself or her own being having multiple rooms within yourself, mm. and um, to get to the kind of I mean the belief which I wouldn't. Um, consider for myself like the belief in god to be this like final room but in on the journey you always have different different encounters within yourself just within yourself and then of course with the outside in your behavior um but i just really like the um just like this inner castle um view on yourself with this different rooms that are there to discover and um i also believe in that actually to have a life that is never fully discovered or you will always learn something new i wanted to ask as well to pivot slightly there's a robert burns poem that seems mm -hmm. you know my heart is in the highlands which you know forms the basis of one of the tracks which obviously i was very curious about um 
being from Britain, to see that energy come into the music. So what was your connection to this this poem and how did it end up in in interior? Yeah, it was, um, I was living in Vienna and studying there. And while I was being there, um, me and my father, we were sending each other um, choral music. And he once sent me um, this one. Um, it was an adaptation of Avo Pert. And I really <laughs> felt uh, also the lyrics in the sense of, to um, have a, I mean, the Highlands as a very specific place, but also more for me, the Highlands as a place I can only imagine because I've never been there, but still having a sense of longing for something and uh, or which is being expressed in the um, in this like original version also um, that it makes you um, like it's just it just raised my empathy so so deeply so I. Um, I wouldn't say that I have a specific love for England or um, Scotland in that sense, but um, I mean, I since I've been younger, um, there was a I've been to England quite a few times. Also, like uh, two of the musicians from the record uh, happened to be from England, so there's a um, there's a color of England very strongly in the record. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I also had like uh, I had one song on my first album, Votive, um, and it actually was a kind of um, adaption, but rewritten. So it was not the original um, text. Um, my bunny lies over the ocean. Um, my bunny's uh, my buddy's over the sea. Come bring back my body to me. So I had the phrase of "Come bring back my body to me" in the sense of questioning a body as a physical uh, thing or as a sensation, also and something you carry with yourself so i mean i like those old <laughs> uh, texts or poems uh i want to return to something you said quite early on which was about this temptation to keep adding layers uh mm -hmm. and you've given all this space to the voice which you know by necessity means that you i guess you need to take away layers from the instrumentation and there is so much faith in the ability of minimal elements to provide like the necessary energy on these tracks just you know like very very reduced um, instrumental accompaniments to to use so I mean what was that like just kind of developing this sense of like okay this is the instrumentation we're now going to leave it open it's just going to be this and the voice uh, was that difficult to apply that level of restraint or yeah how did it pan out mm, it was actually this recording of this record was the first time that it happened at one place so like in one studio um and not like collecting tracks over i mean i did the the drafts i did at my place um at home um and they were already very they already had these like very basic um instrumentation like um because i also felt that um their that the harmonium was the first instrument to start with it has such a depth already from just um just the object itself so with um it mm -hmm. like it pours the air into itself and 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 then it bre it kind of breathes the instrument and um so it, didn't I think it's also almost in respect towards the other instruments as well, um, because I, yeah, it was the first time using a harmonium before. I did a lot with Ableton, which I haven't read. I mean, just for arranging things, I used Ableton again, but like really withdrawing from from very um, digital or like all these tools, um, artificial tools, and yeah. So I think mutual uh, room for natural sounds one really striking presence on the record is hopefully i've got the name right this joshua ben joseph <laughs> appears on rain on god's yeah. hill which um i listened to the record in bed and uh yeah. and one of the times i was listening to it and as i was dropping off to hear to have a a different voice suddenly emerge like a different character <laughs> and like what he, a voice <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah exactly it, um uh, yeah, jolt with me awake because it's like being on a walk on your own and then finding one other person um, who, yeah, has, has a very distinctive voice. So uh, how did Joshua Ben Joseph um, come to appear on the record? It's such a beautiful inclusion. But uh, yeah, tell me a bit about how they became involved. 
Yeah, so very, it was a journey, actually, really, to come across him because I was in London uh, kind of autumn two years ago and I was visiting um, his, the best friend of, uh, of my, uh, the brother of the best friend of my father, um, James Young, and he used to be the um, keyboard player, pianist in the last uh, resemblance of Nico's band, like The Fraction, oh. and... Um, but I've known him since I'm like a child and was kind of like the only person within growing up on the countryside that visited us that brought music into our house or like making music themselves. So it's a kind of important person mm. for me. So I was uh, visiting him in Oxford and um, and we I played him also a few uh, tracks of the EP and then he played me Joshua Ben Joseph because he happened to have uh, produced his album and I was just very struck by hearing this voice and it was the first time I had the urge to have someone featuring me because I never done this and I also like there's a f like I have a few encounters also actually also on the records um that I shared with you and we talk about them later of um vocals of urgency i feel that they um mm. express something for me or i hear something throughout the singing um that comes from a very um deep inside i mean maybe that's a bit too simple to say but i had a very strong sensation hearing him and so i asked him to um uh, write lyrics and he i also s i didn't send him the lyrics uh so he listened to the um song and responded in a way i was i mean i was still surprised i was expecting very much of him as a writer <laughs> already but um the way he understood the lyrics and responded it's crucial but um also very beautiful so uh, amongst the live dates you've got associated with this release was one at berlin planetarium um which i've been to once before it's a nice space uh how did that go Besides, I mean, I was uh, very um, glad. I mean, it was the. I think it was the appropriate space for the. I shouldn't sound to, to. Uh, yeah, but it can also sound as it sounds. I think it was a appropriate place for the music because yeah, it has this. Uh, I think it's nice when the ceiling has a um, space up high. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And yeah. I mean, I was also really. Um, trying to um push my booker for um having more of course and churches playing but also like a space like a planetarium is already um pretty gracious in that sense mm. um which just didn't really worked out but it was more from the uh, organizational team of the planetarium not from my side i really worked hard to have a um projection for the screen and yeah they just didn't want it this they were just very old uh they didn't the old want it? days oh, yeah no. they were just kind of blocked in the sense of what <laughs> you want to do something new no but let me tell you we've done this for uh that that's our uh our organization of this uh concert series and we always do it like that instead uh. of just acknowledging that somebody's actually putting extra work to to make it become a um yeah, experience, but that's fine. I... <laughs> oh, that's a shame. Yeah, yeah so it could have been yeah, full of like everyone. When, yeah, it could have been full of joy, especially. I mean, I was still, after it, I was still also very joyous, and we also shot a movie there, which will be released um, when the record is also coming end of February. Um, but just, yeah, it's just so strange why people uh, put obstacles instead of deciding for joy <laughs> yeah, right oh i'm so sorry to hear that can can you tell me a bit about the film sure um it's kind of it's a it's an interesting um it's a, it's a bit fiction also a part of it so it's um me being i'm starting with uh like uh and bring me my heart um the track mm. sing it live on stage and then I'm kind of leaving the planet, uh, I'm entering the planetarium as myself, but there's another version of me being on stage. So I um, enter actually the performance, the concert. Um, I'm sitting in the row with all the other people watching the concert and um, singing it, or like kind of like making this lip sync moments of um, 
humming the song myself because it's mine <laughs> and I leave the planetarium <laughs> again but um in the dress of the um so it's kind of like two two versions or like the on and the off stage <laughs> person in a very fictional I mean it's planetarium it's in space <laughs> it's close to space I think you can can uh fiction is not <laughs> wrong <laughs> absolutely and there's also another a uh, movie i mean it's a movie it's a very short movie but about the process of recording in this uh, cool studio <laughs> faust uh, studio in germany um and it's also really like also like playful kind of music video behind the scenes recording me humming the drums and uh, or like uh, yeah making the recording yeah oh, lovely um i guess you the film will hold all the details but Tell me a yeah. bit about the experience recording in that space. Yeah, what was it like? Yeah, it was uh, two times. Uh, one was already in 2021, I think. Yeah, kind of that time was the EP recording. And um, yeah, so it's kind of like the house I could refer to also having grown up in a house. So it's a very different feeling if you stay at the place where you're also recording the music and you just spend the entire time there. So we were both times there for maybe like four to five days and um yeah you cannot uh, also like um the owner of the studio very um very wonderful um <laughs> person uh, hans joachim irmler like also mm. former member of the faust uh, band is also there full time <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean he lives there <laughs> <laughs> so and he's also cooking there which is also like a very experimental um thing <laughs> it's, it's also bringing like it's just like you have dinner together most of the nights and um you're, you're just within the cosmos of another person also like it's hard to avoid that this is the home of someone also mm. so um but it doesn't or it hasn't kept me from feeling very comfortable there and also like just having having a room that is only dedicated to this one thing to your record that's a very great privilege in that sense so i was the first time and i think it's it's a way i would like to approach also future projects um dedicating a place to a record mm. and um i mean not that the lyrics the writing that's something that happens on other journeys in between every situation that passes but um doing the final thing of putting everything together at one place and one house uh that's very beautiful yeah absolutely oh great well rosa the record interior is mm -hmm. fabulous i will include a link <laughs> so that people can dive in as well um yeah so let's go to your important record style um mm. one question i like to ask about this point is about how you thought about the word important when picking your list of three records so was yeah. there a way that you understood the word important in order to come up with the list of records that you did yeah so um i think like one record i picked from julia shortread is the as a musician i'm also working with together and her voice is so close um to mine that i just feel um with this record because i also have this very beautiful friendship with her this record touches me every time when i listen to it because it's like listening to her and knowing her um and it's also something i wanted to share here and uh, like uh, the tear garden is just because of edward k spell i had to pick one of his projects like i'm a very big fan or fan is maybe not the word i would use it's a strange description of <laughs> being i've never been a fan i think but um i have a um i admire his way of telling stories and all of his projects and his voice it's just i don't know it's, uh it ha has so much character and in every, every projects like the uh solo projects and also like the legendary pink dots and um and the third record um Ah, yeah, low. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> I think I picked this one in the sense of uh, production also of the record, how the songs are so 
intertwine with each other and the beautiful bridges in between them. And especially because, um, and I think I would still, if someone would ask me my favorite song, it would still be um, Dancing in Blood because I, that was the first song I heard of the band. I didn't knew the um, more acoustic guitar things from before. I knew them by this record. Wow. But I just heard the first um, few seconds of uh, Dancing in Blood and I knew I will... <laughs> I will dedicate myself to it. And I went to the, I was also, I think it was maybe also the time of listening or approaching the record. I was really in a kind of a chaotic state. And I went, and they were also playing in Vienna. And I went to the concert and it was, yeah. Oh. I think the most, or not the most beautiful, I don't want to pressure the concert for being what it was, but it was a great, experience very deep all of them have a very yeah a multiple understanding of music for me that is a very tantalizing preview of these three records did you have a preference for the one you wanted to talk about first a julia's record would be the i would go into our story also yeah great um, so maybe i start there because maybe for the others i don't have too many words um because <laughs> it's music <laughs> so, um, <laughs> oh it's my job to um throw a load of <laughs> rambling thoughts at you and <laughs> see yeah. what sticks so yeah, all good. But sometimes i really have a or not a problem that's too much but um sometimes it's it's so great to listen to music and <laughs> Um, yeah, but so it's just like sensational descriptions I could give, but with Julia it's different. <laughs> uh huh. Gotcha. So, <laughs> so this is a uh, Violet yeah. Sun, right? Um, Violet by Sun. Short read. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I know the the record came out not last year, the year before, so 2022. Yeah. And I knew the songs very deeply before already because we toured with them together also in Japan. So I met her as I was um, traveling to Japan 2016 by myself and I organized a show there and I ended up being on the same show with Julia the first time we met there also and we both uh, yeah, noticed that our voices are very, um, very close to each other in the way we also write and, um, and also with the music. I mean... And um, Julia is coming from a very interesting uh, scene from Japan, which is called Acid Folk. <laughs> right. And um, so there's a few um, few musicians. Uh, also, like one is actually living in London now, Shoko. Um, uh -huh. And we also played with Shoko in Tokyo. But that was after. So we, um, we met just 2016, this one night, but we had a very deep connection already and um she came to berlin a few months later staying for a month in my apartment in wedding before i moved to vienna and we started um making songs together and also planning to tour and then we went touring 2017 through japan so this like songs and being was the first time touring also um with someone and uh, it was very different states of being on this tour of course so we had a few longer nights and then we had to play super early because the concerts in japan were sometimes also something like during the day like at wow. this one place we played once at 2 p.m and another time at 7 p.m and both of us were extremely um extremely uh sleepy and um, tired from the night before <laughs> so we both cried in our concerts oh, and, it was, and it was the small town um, in the region of Sabe uh, so not like the most uh, not as you uh, imagine like a pump pumping Tokyo or like the complete opposite so there was like maybe three people at the concert at 2 p.m. so it was a very and yet yeah, so she was singing these songs and I know them from my heart. So this record is also like um, beautiful for me to come back to our memories that we um, shared at this time. And yeah, this journey really uh, shaped, like I was making photos there and with these photos I 
gotten to the university in Vienna. So I, wow. I love when you can reflect on things um, that like that are appearing in a circle and they are just like feeding each other, but on a natural way. So like yeah. it's the same as with with Joshua. So there's I wouldn't I haven't had done this yet that I work with musicians that I've never encountered. I mean, or that I haven't encountered on a special way, just because I, I don't know, like, I think there's many collaborations where I'm someone sometimes like, oh, okay, how, how did this happen? I mean, you never know, but um, I think it's, I appreciate the very natural way and trust this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, so that's an, is that, that's an intentional thing for you where it's like, uh, I'll bring yeah. people into my music if, I already have like a precedent of almost I was going to say non-musical connection but something that transcends simply the desire to create a piece of music together yeah or just kind of you feel there's a shared honesty in a mm. sense yeah <laughs> so that's something it's interesting you mentioned uh, Julia's voice being like similar to yours um, it's a I mean, it's a wonderful voice I think the thing that really uh came out at me in this album is um she seems to have this really intimate understanding of uh where her voice resides in relation to the instruments it's always she she finds the pocket uh and it never sounds like she's doing this deliberately or like overly mindfully but just finds the negative space where she can kind of let her voice run loose um yeah, I wonder if it's when it's someone who has a voice that you perceive to be similar to yours. Uh, do you feel like that you're kind of um, feeding off each other or rebounding off each other in terms of discovering possibilities of you know what your voices can do? I think it's like when you, um, I mean, because in the end, the voice is also a expression of yourself it's like when you feel finally understood by someone in that sense i think mm. and it's mutual uh for both of us i can say so um because you there's so many voices and uh, and it's not that i feel charmed in that sense that she sounds like me there's i i, I wouldn't i mean my voice for me is a term uh, as a term as a mean of expression and of singing in the end about things that I cannot speak about or that I don't find other ways to communicate. So um, it's not that I hear my voice from the songs and I'm thinking about it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. So when I when I heard um, Julia's voice, um, it was just like, I understand you in that sense from the from the impact also you put on on the expression of your emotions and i could tell that we might share also like similar stories that happened in our lives because um the songwriting of hers and the songwriting of mine is very intertwined with um with what has happened <laughs> to you um so i think in that sense i felt the connection this record as well uh mm -hmm. So I've just heard this record. This is my first time discovering it. I've given it a mm. couple of listens. Uh, it mm. sounds like you saw these songs in a live iteration and then mm. heard them within the recorded context. Tell, tell me about Julia live or the experience of seeing Julia live. W mm. What happens when these songs are presented in a room? Mm, I really, and I mean, she, she's, or she was playing at these concerts with her guitar, which she's also still doing but also has a band sometimes now. So, and I haven't seen that, for All example. Right. So, yeah, um, which I would be very curious to see. And, um, but seeing her back in the days um, by herself, she has a very, very um, beautiful expression when she's also singing. So her face uh, is like, I don't know, uh, it's very, very um, wonderful to watch because you, it's like when the, uh, process of the interior coming to the outside and being shared in the room and it gives a there's a calmness and um yeah i couldn't stop uh listening to them like i never got tired i mean i could also imagine that when you tour with this 
annoying band. <laughs> <laughs> But um, at one day you're like, ah, oh, again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Couldn't you do a different order? Because I mean, I've never. It's still remains my only tour that I made with another musician. So it's like, right. I appreciate what I have, and I'm excited for what is to come. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I can definitely not compare it. Oh wow! Yeah, no, that's very special because, as you say, there's only really two ways that it can go when you're presented with a certain set of music night after night, and yeah, either you just driven yeah. to uh, madness, yeah, or inwards into the music in a way where you're just yeah. like, oh my gosh, and you get the slight variable of the different room and circumstances, but the same mm -hmm. material, so you get this lovely multi-sided perspective on this. Yeah music um it's really wonderful that worked out for you and that um you know that julia's music is is the one for you um uh, are you so it sounds like obviously you've worked on songs you've played together do you have plans to do more together yeah she was uh, in berlin uh, last summer and we recorded the first ep oh. um with tracks that are from that time so actually finally getting them in a proper shape uh and we produced them and i will go there in july full july to tokyo and first half we um have a kind of studio sound residency in tokyo and then the other half we try to organize uh, some shows together so i'm really looking forward to go back like really <laughs> Rosa, let's go to your second important album. Uh, yeah, if you give me the name of it and then a little bit about why it's important to you. Okay, so we go on with Low and Double Negative. Yeah, I love <laughs> record um, <laughs> because um, both of the, I really enjoy the harmony also of the two voices, like uh, his and Mimi's. Um, on the songs and yeah as i already mentioned like the production which i know was bj burton which also made me first i mean um i haven't really listened much to records that he has been producing but you can clearly sense that um th like the difference of this record to the records before and i because it was the first one i um was surprised by him the things from earlier days but not in a negative sense or anything mm. but um yeah i just think that the way there's like all these um also from the from the vocals like these um, moments in between the tracks i really enjoy the way they're kind of like they have this like echo and then they float into the other song and um just make it so complete i must say i'm, a, I'm not a fan of all the songs on the record but i would have to look on the names because i'm really bad with this like i'm I'm really bad with uh song names and and like yeah, <laughs> things because i because for me because it's not so often that i think it got a bit rarer that i'm listening to full albums or i don't know i mean i have grown up already with itunes and loading stuff on my um ipod so i think this like you get one single and then you you listen to that one i think it's a very common thing for me already mm. and it's rarer that i'm really enjoying a full album but still this one um it's like one piece for me and i don't have to like everything from it but it's still one of my fav favorite records so do you remember how you discovered it i know you mentioned it was through dancing and blood right um dancing and blood and actually because i saw the concert of them in vienna and I was like, oh, who's that band? And then I listened to Dancing on Blood as a first song. And then I was really sure <laughs> 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 I'm up for it. Yeah. 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 
what was it like seeing these songs live? So, because because I I'm really into this record, and uh, I've seen little snippets of them playing these songs live, and it's always, it, you know, it was always such a question for me where I was like, how how are they going to do this? Because this record is all about that production. Um, what yeah, happens when true. you know that production is taken away? I mean, obviously, given the caliber of the band you know that these songs are going to have a certain weight and that yeah. it's not the production doing all the heavy lifting but yeah what was it like to see them like in that context too it was very organized in the <laughs> sense that um they had this uh light construction also behind them so that really worked like this was rays of lights like steps in the air kind mm. of and then um, Mimi was on the drums and having a microphone also there and singing and he was uh, with a guitar and if I'm wrong, I think there were just the two of them but it's a it's kind of almost like a a bit like a um, dream for me because mm. I I was so charged with emotions going to this um, to this concert I was deeply heartbroken as I encountered the <laughs> record. <laughs> I mean, that's what I meant with chaotic before, um, which is a very, I mean, being heartbroken is, I think, one of the absurdest states of uh, your own being. Mm. So um, it really, um, I fell into this concert and I woke up after the concert again. So I think it's more... It's more something um, like musically, it totally worked out in that sense of the production being such a striking element. Uh, they still had these transitions, a lot of the drums that I can remember and the vocals. I think I, I believe also that the things that are the most beautiful, sometimes that you cannot remember them, to they become something very abstract. Um, yes. and also I never really never pull out my phone for recording concerts because I I w won't be there any longer yeah. like it's not I don't know it's like you kind of and also you, yeah it just shapes the whole view of not just you everyone else around you and um, so yeah I, I, yeah I have nothing to recall other than my memory in the sun that's not very good <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean two things I feel like that that's a nice recollection to have of a record which by mm. its nature is obfuscated to hell so <laughs> to have a memory that also has that same sense of being kind of partly withheld is very nice um, yeah. but uh, so, so you mentioned the fact that you were experiencing heartbreak when seeing this concert so that's quite like a um I guess quite a vulnerable state of being to then step into this music. I guess there's like a potential to be like hyper receiving whatever's being yeah. transmitted when you feel like that, Absolutely. right? Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. I also encountered someone I briefly know and um, was like, we've gotten to a very short conversation, like, uh, how are you? And we were both like very lost after the concert. <sighs> and. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was trying to ask, like, uh, so which, like, underground do you have to take now to get back home? I don't know where I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, like, I had this actually, like, when things are deeply moving you, it doesn't have to be your own personal things. Like, yesterday was a movie that I've seen, like, the um, anatomy of a case. <laughs> oh. I was, like... Yeah. I was uh, very lost. Uh, first, I wanted to go to this one because there's kind of like a gathering in Berlin every Tuesday for um, Flinta. And, uh, but it's a very crowded place and I knew I, I cannot go there because if I'm, if I'm coming there with all of my uh, sensations and emotions inside, um, I would just have very, or I don't know which kind of conversation I could actually have yeah. other than being full like full front emotional about everything yeah <laughs> and it's like nothing you can encounter with someone i mean can be a very great coincidence if it happens to be a stranger but um yeah yeah <laughs> that doesn't 
doesn't really work sometimes. <laughs> For sure. There's almost something quite cruel, I think, about the fact that when you finish one of those really devastating experiences at a concert, yeah. which can be so monumental, <laughs> they're just like, okay, yeah. now leave. Uh, <laughs> and where? Where? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For it too. No. Yeah. Yeah, you're just rendered a bit nomadic, aren't you, for a bit after that? <laughs> oh, yeah, God. I listened to this uh, because they had this one piano piece, like this very well-known piece from Chopin, if I'm wrong, but the, like one part of the score of the movie, and I kept on listening to this on repetition mm, right. until, oh, I, wow. until I was back home. <laughs> so that was your way of sort of processing the experience i think yeah, yeah. Ah, like wow. not leaving the experience also like because sometimes also like it can be also so crucial when a concert is over or a movie and you feel like no i'm not ready to go <laughs> now <laughs> like yeah for me it, it hasn't finished no. i i had that with um drive my car I saw that at the cinema and then came out and put the soundtrack on all the way home. I was like, it's three hours long. And I was like, nah, uh, yeah. we're making this four. Like, oh, yeah, I, it's a great movie. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Um, yes, so Lo, I, I want to return to Lo. And it sounds like, so since Double Negative, have you gone back into their discography? How do you connect with other albums by them? Mm. Also, I mean, I'm, but this songs, um, I could recall, I couldn't even recall the names and the album they refer to, but I mean, I like them very much as much as I also sometimes really appreciate it. Uh, country, I mean, there's a sense of country music in there, I, I would mm. say, or like folk, folkish country music. And I had another encounter with a musician, um, what is his name again? Joshua Ray Walker. It's another uh, uh -huh. American musician um, of uh, who's also, or he's really going into the genre of country more than they do. But um, this very, I appreciate it. Like with the old low uh, tracks, the simplicity. Then, mm. like this, yeah, very, um, yeah, this non product or like it's been produced, but like, uh, like it's rather calmer and the way it's been produced but i but i didn't have the same encounter as i had with this other album so i cannot really go deep in that other than super more superficial descriptions of like there wasn't this like and it's a sensation <laughs> or also joshua ray walker um i mean was so different seeing him live than listening to the record of his because he played a private club in Berlin and um, was just by himself with an acoustic guitar and he's like a fanatic, uh, great uh, guitarist. Huh. Um, had this like, also like this way of uh, like kind of steel guitar. Ugh, yeah. This, I'm, n I'm not a person of uh, like this great descriptive words that, that tell... <laughs> that um you're coming also from this profession of music but um so you, but he had this like long ring this long metal ring that you use in country music a lot so and the uh -huh. way he was also singing was like just crazy because he's um having like also the way he uses his vocals is like um he's doing this like howling which uh, right. I'm, I'm, that's also something probably that I could have put, but I didn't, it's not the full album of them, but like when someone is howling in a song, I don't know, like it really catches me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean like howling, howling like, in what oh, sense? Whoa, like, oh, that kind yeah, yeah, of, wow, yeah. right, yes. That's so, yeah. Well, that yeah. gets Actually, you in like a positive way, you uh, mean? Yeah, totally positive. Um, there's a band and this, song where he's singing the company and the company of wolves da, da, da. and he's also howling and it's just like i don't know, <laughs> 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 I just know. <laughs> that's how i can talk about <laughs> wow <laughs> oh, that is that, that is... sense but it's just i don't know like that yeah that makes you triggers a different part <laughs>
Rosa, we have one more important record. Please give me the name of it and then a little bit about why this one's important to you too. Okay, um, so it's from the Tear Garden, from the album To Be an Angel Blind, The Cripple Soul Divide. <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, I think the title of the uh, record already says itself. The, there must be a great writer within this band. And this other. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Edward K. Spell. Um, it's like, it's not, I mean, I think like his formations are always have a different color of the music. Um, my favorite song of the album i do have this time because i mean <laughs> it's uh, in search of my rose and i uh -huh. felt very responsive to it because maybe of the rose and i <laughs> um <laughs> i just uh but like the whole album it's um i think there's kind of like because i've been growing up in berlin being very um kind of when i was a teenager i really fell into um kind of more wave and post-punk music and i went to all of this um events by myself when i was in high school still um because nobody wanted to come with me <laughs> <laughs> i didn't knew anybody uh, who enjoyed the music as i did um so like like there was this uh, venue urban spree or is is this venue urban spree but it was like very small um events in that time from different uh like also when like total black and what was the other there was another label but it doesn't exist any longer um but rain rain also released uh -huh. something there um but, and i really like rain also and blackest ever black the label yeah yeah this one yeah because because it closed right yes it did right yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. so so yeah some events from them actually in berlin um and they were quite small it was like 2000 i don't know like i was 15 or 14 something <laughs> so it's uh six plus six is 12 years ago yeah um uh -huh. some time already <laughs> damn it <laughs> yeah um but why am i speaking about it because um tear garden yeah is i think also coming from from a post-punk wave background also like this older generation mm musicians and um i don't know if they ever refer to this chaos magic thing which <laughs> other likes of the kind of uh, music often do but um yeah it's kind of like i'm pretty sure that edward k spell has his very own view on the world i mean there's uh, i mean i'm not sure if you could almost relate the music to also neo folk which i yeah really like sometimes but there's also like this difficulty um which i also encountered actually very recent of some of the lyrics and some of the backgrounds of the musicians because you i don't know it's it's a bit complicated i think or complex i don't even know if you can say complicated if you sympathize if you feel if you have a good gut feeling or not but um do you know what i mean with neo folk like this like oh like yeah. Uh, yeah so there's uh and uh, there's like some notions sometimes in edward k spells like some i think more in the thing um when i was i, I saw him live with like legendary pink dots in berlin mm -hmm. last year which was super great also like just his whole stage persona wearing his sunglasses and his little hat <laughs> It's just very also yeah. Just I think I already said it a couple of times like this like char uh, characteristics, but yeah, there's some things I'm um, um some yeah, but uh, yeah. Do you mean <laughs> the kind of caution that you feel around so certain aspects of the neo folk thing? Yeah, have I mean the fascistic mm, ties to some of it. I yeah. mean, I, I put it straight here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, the and the ways. Uh, yeah, there's ways in which that feeds into the music which sometimes i guess are less explicit and you're not always sure yeah. what is connecting to that kind of thread is is that the kind of thing you're getting at yeah and yeah totally no i mean the symbolism isn't used by like them like uh like edward case bell or these like band projects but it's used and i'm i'm just or this like i mean what 
folk music always carries is a certain type of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel. I mean, there's uh, there's a huge uh, expression of romanticism. I mean, I also um, I think in my press text, actually, this album is also linked to to a uh, folk, neo yes. folk. So yeah. it's it's something. It's a genre I still appreciate, but I observe it. But it's but I also kind of I mean everything comes from a person or like every uh, every music piece has been written by a person with certain thoughts and certain views on this world and some of them are out there and some of them you don't even know yes um, so i think that's also maybe something positive and very it's not hidden in neo folk at least <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very much there you, you can discuss it and uh, mm. it's there to be discussed i think yeah but i'm i'm i, I feel I'm, i'm so i've gotten very very cautious with um how i frame things yeah like recently it's it's just i think it's yeah i see it with many friends i speak to so yeah yeah for sure um th this record i mean one band that this made me think of a little bit was uh, uh i've you know, been a huge current 93 fan for a long mm, time and yeah. a very similar kind of energy and the same kind of uh sort of prophetic angle on the lyricism the lyrics are like mm -hmm. from a um maybe i shouldn't scrutinize them too closely <laughs> i don't know but just uh some of the lines are beautiful um mm -hmm. are the lyrics one of the main reasons that you connect with this record yeah no i think that's something that is very important for me in general lyrics which is interesting because for some people lyrics are secondary i i put myself in that mm. category generally this record i think there was just some lines that i found i couldn't ignore they just kind of leapt out there's mm. one oh my gosh you probably know the exact line but mm. it was something like uh please be please shut up for a moment so i can read the future <laughs> which is which is great mm. uh, um yeah. but yeah why do you think lyrics have this kind of primacy for you where you connect to them kind of first and foremost where does that come from do you think mm, i think it's just uh interesting because it's for me the expression of things i don't want to talk about or i cannot talk about so i think sometimes when i listen to others uh, lyrics i'm just trying to listen to them as i also try to listen to people when they speak mm um in person in a room and um so I'm, and i'm interested to hear what they want to say i mean it's i mean it's not it's not every time that there is lyrics in a song and i couldn't appreciate this song like there's uh, some mashups of i don't know like or bootlegs even of <laughs> pop songs that i enjoy listening to um and there's uh, very few words left right, <laughs> right the general thing about remixes i mean I had one experience with that also myself a couple of times. Um, but I'm just curious what people try to express and uh, why they chose music to do that. With this record, this is the first time I've kind of listened through it. Mm. Primarily, this is, again, this is only like, I've listened to it like twice through. So this all may sound very superficial to someone who has a deeper connection to it. But two kind of main energies where there is just like a huge crushing sadness um mm -hmm. very sad but then also like a psychedelic thing where sometimes the sadness feels like it's pretty much shed and things get kind of funky and i was surprised as the record kind of first took that turn you know where you've got stuff like with wings and um the track prior to that i can't remember but my question is do you connect with all of this record because your favorite track is um my reference right which to me sounds like like towards the kind of sadder bleaker end of things do you connect yeah. with the whole record or yeah tell me a bit about that yeah i connect with the whole record as a fall through um if you listen through like mm -hmm. yeah because it has this um development of yeah kind of sad beginning or like 
motions of uh, loss and, and or like movements of life and then it gets this like other tone to it and I think that's also like uh, really beautiful it doesn't always work out on albums also but I think on this one it totally does that the um, color of the music is uh, changing um, so vividly <laughs> why is that your favorite song in search of my rose um, yes <laughs> Believe it or not, but it's another, um, uh, or believe it or not, I mean, what the, you <laughs> cannot, <laughs> no, <laughs> but um, it's another uh, experience of very um, strong emotions um, I encountered, and I um, just, this song was really catching me there, and it's, it's not, I wouldn't say that if I'm in a, I think that I, in general, appreciate the um, describing it as sad doesn't feel really right. But um, I appreciate the songs, in general, songs more since ever. Um, I can remember that are having more a darker feeling to them or sadder expression, at least. Mm. Um, so that's uh, I can see that with um, most of the songs or albums. Um, that there's this one song that encountered me in a very um, expressive moment and then I um, looked up for the full um, and like got to appreciate the whole thing and actually also like I really appreciate it when a song is leading me to an album and I can listen to the whole album there's that's such a great um, way to spend your time listening to an album like time you take for it to um yeah for the start and finish and and especially like with records and there's i have this one record of godspeed you black computer which was gifted to me once and there's also like they also made this like infinity i talked about on my record on the b-side uh-huh which makes it never stop and it's like that's the ultimum of of an album for me when when you already get yourself into the sensation of listening to the full album and it's like yeah it's like with the good concert the good movie that you don't want to leave yeah i was just gonna say it sounds <laughs> very similar is that godspeed record uh, f sharp a sharp infinity i don't know i would have to look i'm uh, as i said like with names i also had the name of the um tear garden album uh <laughs> in a tab because um <laughs> i really don't it's really it's uh... like it's it's just it's the music in the end um yeah but it has a it has a cover with a black and white photo that was a very limited copy okay there was a little coin inside a coin without a number like a oh coin shoot of, wow yeah 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 ah yeah it's here um it's f a infinity yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah f sharp a sharp one? infinity yeah, ah, yeah. yeah. Uh, fabulous. sharp it's sharp this uh, sign <laughs> the sign of unknown world <laughs> yeah i didn't hear the english word for it yeah oh yeah yeah oh yeah. i see oh cool because yeah i guess yeah. Uh, yeah it's not immediately translatable is it all right hashtag yes yeah. yes, yes that's yes. what but it's not like f hashtag a hashtag infinity <laughs> <laughs> i guess it is now strange <laughs> <laughs> yeah they started that whole thing um yeah Oh wow. Okay. Oh, that yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So you've got the infinity there that kind of locks you into the experience of that yeah. record for as long as you want to be there. Yeah, um, but I think it's. I mean, it's it's a quality for such uh, projects, but it's not a quality for your um, tendency in general, probably as a person that you really like to fall into things and then you don't want to get out. <laughs> just <laughs> like, a, just a side note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean. Um, <laughs> You mentioned going to concerts a lot solo. Mm. I found that always to be an advantage of going to things solo is that um, mm -hmm. you can uh, reside in the interior of that experience for yeah. as long as you like and nobody yeah. says, what do you think? Is that similar for you? Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy going by myself because I'm also like, I also have this when I go somewhere very um, planned or like I want to be there. I almost feel um, as I would be cheating if I'm with another person because my focus would shift. It's hard for me to yeah. to keep my focus and dedication to something if I'm not on my own. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm, um, yeah, I really enjoy that. Yeah. So like, if you're going to say a gallery or something where you mm. can. Oh, um, I, I mean, I would go to a gallery, but I would uh, avoid going to any such thing like an opening. Right. It's a very um. That's like you can be there by actually there. I would prefer to go. Not by myself. I would, <laughs> I'm yeah. super lost when I'm uh, going to something like public event, which is there to be. I mean, a opening of a gallery is the opposite of a concert, probably almost in the sense that it's there to connect with people and network and things like that, and uh, and be communicative, almost in such on such a level that the works themselves don't really get to be seen by at least by me I, I cannot really concentrate on such thing if i'm overflown with sociology uh so 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 sheolic no <laughs> damn it I'm, <laughs> I'm so overflown i cannot find the description of the word like yeah just um overflown with the like all the people and yeah there and the yeah also like the light and everything it's like so far from a concert space which feels so safe <laughs> yeah yeah and, and humble yeah, yeah. for sure yeah. it's a bit like i think trying to look at artworks in that kind of context it's it's like when someone talks to you when you've got headphones on and you have that switch in your head where you're suddenly like oh um i, I now need to occupy the outside world uh yeah yeah there's a real disjunct there so to veer back to um, mm -hmm. the tear garden, I just want to see, is there, is there anything else about this record that you're kind of mm. burning to get out to express about your connection with it um, that we haven't covered already, Rosa? No, I think it's sad. <laughs> it's sad. sad. <laughs> <laughs> So I have uh, one more question for you, which is about how you tend to interact with music listening day to day. And that includes things like, how do you buy music? Like, where do you buy it? What kind of formats do you gravitate towards? Uh, where do you do your music listening predominantly? So yeah, tell me a bit about that. Um, I think I get most of the things from Bandcamp because mm -hmm. it's the most efficient tool actually because you really have the music and um you can download it and it's it's not physical but it almost feels like physical uh -huh. um in, in germany there's this one detective series which is super old it's called the free question marks it's like three little boys right. that do like they try to um solve mysteries and that's the only reason i have spotify because i cannot listen to them otherwise no way um, or like any streaming platform, I also switch them time to time, but I really don't enjoy that sense of um, listening to music um, at all. Hmm. And records, I buy, um, I have a small collection of records, and so when I'm at home, I mostly listen to records, um, or I listen actually to BBC Scotland radio. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> like I, I really... I don't know. I started at one point. Um, I mean, I have a, also I have a hand soap from the islands right. <laughs> in my <laughs> kitchen. It's just when you fall into something, it's sometimes hard to switch routines. There's many routines here that I enjoy repeating. Just uh, they're giving me comfort, and I kind of. It's also when you listen to the same radio station, you kind of get used to the voices, the different. Um, times and um yeah like drive time and uh yeah. mornings with k adams and what i really enjoy at this uh radio station is this part of when they um start to um open uh the channels for people to have a call things they have on their mind like 
kind of like uh, social unbalanced things in society um problems at the open kitchen uh, for uh homeless and people in need just like very broad term uh, topics huh. yeah. and i i really appreciate it even though it's coming from another country and um it's not the like i'm not facing this in my uh, in the city i'm living but i don't see this in any like german radio station that they uh, that they're actually really there to let also like people speak so and i think it actually is a very great way of um yeah getting people being more interacted with politics and uh, i don't know just making them feel part of something which they are <laughs> every right. day right so yeah. it's, uh, i don't know it's i really enjoy and i think oh no i know why i started i know It was this case of Lucy, uh, this nurse who killed like babies. Lucy like, Letby, yeah. Yeah, Lucy Letby, yeah. Because I I read about it in the news and then I um, listened on BBC and I kind of switched over the channels, but I ended up at Scotland um, because they had the biggest, because they had this discussion. And that's also a topic I'm facing a lot at the moment. Also in the movie yesterday, this like um, topic of... Um, justice and they had the question for discussion because the, there wasn't like this um law that lucy let be has to come to um the court to face her um face her a uh, sentence um but the families of the victims they wanted her to be there like they mm. um, insisted of ha of having her in front of the court facing um the moral but the question was kind of Is she actually uh, capable of seeing her right. uh, her deeds and her? And I'm also reading this book at the moment from Mark O'Connell, A Threat of Violence, about this like double murder of a um, guy called MacArthur that was in, I think Ireland, yeah. Huh. And it's he's also like getting into this like psych of this uh, murder, and. Um, trying and he's like kind of at some moments he's sympathizing with the with this guy who's like from from very um he's coming from a very upper class society so he has this like way of behaving being super charming and you kind of never really believe that he that he was capable of doing so this like things this like moral question i don't know it's really or the good and bad i mean it's never ending yeah um, yeah i think that it's like i don't know that but that was the reason i started listening to bbc scotland because i couldn't wow. let go of listening to um yeah to the what they were expecting her to behave when she would have been there yeah at the court like or if it's actually just another down um uh, downfall of like uh misery because she's just like not not seeing her um her uh responsibility of making a murder yeah yeah wow and so that that meant you ended up on bbc scotland wow i mean <laughs> i i can i can totally understand in the sense that mm. you know we have my partner listens to the archers you know the archers mm -hmm. yeah uh it's exactly yeah. the same thing where it's like you get the recurrent characters it's set in a very mm -hmm. specific location that's kind of remote from where you're at and yeah. you tune into this little world this um mm -hmm. interconnected space outside of your own for a little bit to see how everyone's getting on um it, it makes complete sense i um, think the last time also that was um that like i was in december i was in iceland For a project and um i had to get this bus for um for the airport around 3 a.m or something and i listened to bbc scotland and um there was this one woman um but that like just like being <laughs> so far from home listening to another station from <laughs> even further <laughs> and this it was just like because i also let people speak there for a very long time and it was this one woman um who's um already off work who's uh who relies on like the food um food offer like the community kitchen mm. and who kind of like opposed um on others that there's families coming that use all the ticket like they get a lot of tickets and then she was she was just bragging about this for i think almost like 40 
minutes or something, almost an hour. Wow. But she was so, um, they, like, even though she was complaining, she was, you just heard that she was just uh, desperate and it wasn't a, an act of, um, of like, like, of course there's anger, but not, there wasn't anything aggressive about it. It was just like pure desperation. And I think that's very rare that you, I don't know. I mean, I don't know other radio stations from all over the world, but it, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's definitely to a certain extent, I, you know, I mean, the BBC is rife with bias problems and uh, mm. all this business, but the baked yeah. into it is, you know, things like question time or any questions where mm. uh, the idea is to you bring in, facilitate what feels more like a dialogue between uh, what is perceived as the, you know, the general public and mm. um, institutions of power, whether that be the media or politics. Which um, it's very interesting to hear that that seemed uh, novel to you because I don't have the experience of you know listening to radio stations in other countries and having a sense of it. But mm. yeah, I, I'm German surprised. Radio stations, Oof. oh, it did not a thing on German radio uh, radio at all. No, mm. Mm. wow, <laughs> so interesting, huh? Not really. Gosh, well, um, I, I mean, I've never had. I love asking this question, right? Because everyone consumes uh, music or listening in different ways, but never have I had BBC Radio Scotland brought up. And <laughs> never did I expect it in the context of this interview. Like that is absolutely wonderful, um, <laughs> Rosa. This conversation has been great because I feel like that these three records have been catapults in like all different directions to talk about so much stuff, uh, and I'm grateful to you for bringing them to the table. Yeah, and for you. your to record me. as well thank you so much thank you and to everyone listening see you next time goodbye goodbye